I recommend to people who outline and preach a little different approach. So if you're an outline preacher, let me talk to you now, those of you who are outline preachers. My sermons are outlined, and they're usually 15 to 17 paragraphs. Okay? There's a range. It can be 13, it can be 19, but that's the range. When I say paragraphs, it's because when I do an outline, I can usually kind of like find the, 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 the introductory has four or five, maybe six, and, and how to get to the substance has five or six or seven, and then the conclusion is you know, five or six. Okay, that's, that's how it works. Well, you know, it, um, outline preachers can just be like manuscript preachers. It's, again, going back to the security blanket, right? Um, and, it, and it can be overwhelming for a long time. I had trouble because I was just, uh, yeah, okay, I'm done. Now that I'm done with that point, <laughs> I'm now going to make another point, and I'm going to make it really well. And it was this weird, okay, so I developed something that, that works for me. I uh, usually tighten this up during the late weekend, so maybe Thursday, Friday. By Saturday night, I now have the outline, you know, and, and now I, I, my wife knows it's Saturday night, I need some minutes to tighten this up, and I go and I picture the building. And, um, and I ask myself, is there a, well, let me give you an example here. Let's say the sermon starts out with, um, uh, you know, opening up this topic is a little hard. This is a little delicate. Yeah, window back there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to open it. I bet it opens easy, but I'm thinking that opens hard. So I memorize that. That's the first thing I'm going to look at when I get to church when I start my sermon. Opening this topic is hard. And as I, bro as I broach it with you, I want you to know that even in the time of Jesus, opening this topic was awkward for people. Now, having opened that window, I'm assuming I'm clear and green, so, so let's just uh, okay. But I don't have, there's nobody back there, so there's a gap between this table where the drinks are and, and, the, and the window. So, if my second line is, in my second paragraph, is about, we, we always need someone to help us get to there, then I'm going to look at that gap and go, that's my gap, that's the gap memorize that gap. So I start with the window. Opening this topic is hard, but y'all, we always need, and so we always need somebody to help us get from here to actually being able to do it. And then I'm going to memorize something on the table, and literally, when I'm done, I have a graphic. And graphic memories work for us. We all remember graphics really quick. So literally, my sermon is done in graphics. Okay? And it's a memorized cycle to the room, and I don't ever have to look at my by the end of Saturday night, I'm done. My notes are in my head. They're in a picture. And the picture goes ding, 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 or whatever. Sometimes, and I won't tell you too much, sometimes I use my body parts. <laughs> Better than using yours. Uh, sometimes, though, uh, it's just in the sanctuary, in the, in the altar area. Sometimes it's the windows. But I gotta tell you, if you're an outline preacher, if you can get past even having to look down, that can be really cool. Mm -hmm. And I literally map it. And it's, 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 it's an outline. And what's funny is a lot of times I can still remember my sermon months and months later because it's a graphic. And somebody walk up and say, hey, Rod, that call sermon. I don't, uh, do you remember when you talked about calling? I said, yeah. And you, you said something. I said, well, actually, you, you mean the part when I was talking about calls that are outside? Because some people are called secular. Yeah. And, and <coughs> I, man, I'm glad you remember that. It was the picture of the, the edge of the ceiling, mm -hmm. that there's a range out there and in here, and that edge of the ceiling is cutting us off from the one. That was a good memory for me, right? So literally, I put many of my sermons into a physical structure. Why? Because I really want to read to you. I don't want to be distracted by my content or by tracking the order. I worked on that thing for weeks, if you count sermon topic picking and sermon series picking, it took months. And this week, I worked a lot on this. I want you to have this in your life. You can go to that mountain and think as much as you want with this truth. No restrictions on it. This mountain is open. What's 
said, I'm not with you. This means God doesn't help him. I'm not touching him. That's on my list of research this week because it may be you thinking there's a road. This is not some obscure mountain in the Himalayas, or mm -hmm. I have to say Himalayas here, right? Mm -hmm. This is Pike's Peak. You can go and fish there. Mm -hmm. You can go if you're handicapped. You can go if you're deaf. You can go if you're broken. You, you can take a bus and somebody else can get you there. But you can Sinai anymore. God is open. Right? So you see that? So now that's, is it, notice that's a, that's a thorough going in, but I could use that English from the beginning of the sermon to the end, which is what I'm considering doing. But it's also a graphic. When I'm done, I wouldn't be sad if people walked out saying, wow, thanks, Rod. I can go too. Yes, you can. Okay? Now, I won't be sorry if they, that's what they hear you. So, a couple of things you might want to keep in mind. It's funny, this subject is delicate to me. Jesus was hilarious. He used humor all the time. Matthew 6, when I first learned about Matthew 6, his humor, I did a study on it and found out it was funny. I was reading Bill Cosby's book, Fatherhood, and was amazed that Matthew 6 was funnier than Bill Cosby's book, Fatherhood. <laughs> It's really funny. It uses huge, silly exaggeration to make a point. Some of it gets lost in Aramaic. I did learn this. This is something you won't know a Bible scholar would have been able to give to me that I might have to give to you. So in Aramaic, it seems like that Jesus was saying, remember, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't have the trumpets to play when you give alms. He says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Apparently the one was trumpet, uh, band-leading hand. Rod Brayfinley is now going to give alms. Da, 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 da. Oh, guys. Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. So, I wouldn't have known that had I not had some biblical training that you won't get. So, hey, next time you read Matthew 6, just know when you see him, let don't rather your right hand know what your left hand is doing. One of them suggests that the one hand is directing the band while you're giving the alms. Okay. Other than that little detail, you can read the same thing I could in the passage. But it's funny. But if you don't know it's funny, you won't let it be funny to you. And right as I, I had this great moment, talk about crystallizing something for me. I'm reading about Jesus' use of humor from a boring text on Jesus' use of humor. And I'm in a church where the scripture reader, it's one of those churches where everybody has a Bible. And I'm up the front. I guess maybe I'll speak. I don't know. Anyway, scripture reader says, Would you all now please turn in your Bibles? And every head out there goes, <laughs> <laughs> And I was stunned. Like, wait, wait. No, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, so, I think humor is good in a sermon. Now, the reason I feel delicate about this is because I've seen some horrendous. I went to a church and passed this size starts a sermon. Hi, folks. Thought I'd read a few lines I read on the internet this week. And he reads some funny things off the internet. And then he puts it down. Today I want to talk about <laughs> and just a zero. And his sermon was serious. He never was funny throughout his entire 45-minute sermon. Except then, which was unrelated. And so I say, yes, use humor. But maybe I need to be more careful. So now I'm going to challenge you very specifically. I, I think I have... We have to be done at 3.30, right? I, I, I think I have time to do this. When I was sent to start a church for us in McKinley, I went to Kim Leslie here. He was going to get a PhD in early church. It was his interest. So I called him up and said, could we talk? And uh, so I said, here's the thing. You 
know, I've read a lot about the early church. I was kind of taken with the subjects. I've got all these books on early Christianity, and first 200 years. And, but, you know, I read them like scholars. I, you know, I don't really... But you've read it a lot, and you've read it way better. Could you tell me, how did church feel? I kind of know what they did. Could you please explain? And then I told him, I would like to try to find a way to have our worship service in McKinleyville feel that way. Now the shock for me was our sense of reverence and quiet and fearful respect or whatever, it just isn't part of the early church's story. They had this sense of absolute Hebrew liberation. You are now free to enter the throne room with boldness. There was a Glee, joy, that many of your people would be offended at. <laughs> I can't believe this honorable, disrespectful tone that you. So I say it to people as often as I can. I say, if you can convey the tone of this message, the life of God planted in you and in me and in the planet, of the life of God planted here to make the whole world ex an expression of his will. If you can, if you can put that tone in your sermon, you're going to do all right. You know, that's when humor works. When it's a celebration of the positive message, this amazing gift that we're able to do. Now, if it's just humor, because, well, you know, then it doesn't do much. You see the difference? Now, heads up, if you have a younger congregation, their sense of humor is different. And if you have an older congregation, their sense of humor is different. I found it so interesting in Chico, we had a young congregation at 9, an older congregation at 11. And if I did prep humor, set up humor at 9, they wouldn't laugh. You know, um, I walked into a bar one day, you know, you could feel the younger people going, oh yeah, it's a joke. Okay, joke. Ah, right? But at 11, they love setup humor. I walked into a bar one day. <laughs> at 9, they wanted, oh, whoa, I think I just tripped on myself. Oh. Don't you hate it when you do that? Yeah. Oh, dip again, right? They wanted spontaneous. They wanted the thing that just happened to be the joke. Not a joke you prepared ahead of time. And so that's really hard to do. They wanted a much quicker, livelier humor. Well, so just beware, humor is not easy either, but it's not about humor, it's about tone. Mm -hmm. Why do I use humor? Well, one of the reasons I use humor is to convey tone. The other is that humor is not the opposite of seriousness, it's the opposite of despair. And I'm conveying something that is profound and hopeful. And third, Humor, at least for us guys, and I'm speaking directly to all women, humor is a way you can let me loosen up a little bit. If you're going to go to my deep place, you better do that, or else I'm not allowing you in. So you straight women who never crack a joke, just so you know, that stresses me out. Okay? So if you're going to get serious with me, how do I do? Okay, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about you. <laughs> well, I feel, feel, yeah. and, You know, there's certain tones of laughter and certain types, right? There are mean laughters, and we don't do those, but they're the great ones. Okay, so I recommend tone above all, humor as possible. I recommend that you find access points and that you access people with your faith, with your tone. But there's some other logistical things, aren't there? Uh, preaching. So what I'd like to do is make your ears do and make my ears do and heavy. And I want to do that. Uh, I'm not going to preach a sermon. I feel kind of awkward about doing that. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd uh, I just not 